uh, drug problem and so, how we can actually solve these. So somebody has a, a speaker open. Do you know? Do you, do you, do you, even do you have speaker open? I do, yes. yes, yes are, I can, are people I talking? Okay, that's much better. Yeah. Okay, so, so, hello everybody. So, sorry, sorry about this uh, slow, slow introduction. Uh, my my medication still didn't kick in. I I, I woke up at three a.m. full of excitement to to see and talk to you because uh, we we think that that's a major discovery in the last last fifty years for Pakistan, and and we are all curious how how does it work. So so uh, uh, please joy continue. Oh, I am. Um... I, uh, uh, my husband and I realized when uh, not long, a few, about a year and a half before he died that I um, uh, should, we should do something about it. I had pre-diagnosed him 12 years before he was diagnosed. I have hereditary hyperosmia. My, we now know that my great, great grandmother had it and it has traveled down the female line in the family and uh, each uh, grandmother has really been quite responsible for how uh, it has developed. But one of the things my grandmother said to me was I shouldn't tell anybody. However, when I realized I had pre-diagnosed my husband, we started to speak about it. And uh, it wasn't until I went to a Parkinson's meeting and there were so many other people there with Parkinson's. And I left that meeting and I realized I could differentiate between those who had Parkinson's and those who didn't. So we got home and I explained to him and he said, well, we've got to do something about it. And being a, a consultant anesthetist, he had to find somebody who he felt would take this forward. It was, it was, oh, it was such excitement for him. And it wasn't long before he died, but he really he really wanted this to be forwarded. And we went, I went to a talk on, that uh, Professor Tilo Kunath was doing in Edinburgh on uh, stem cells. And when I stood up and I said to poor Tilo, um, why are we not using the smell of Parkinson's diagnosis earlier? Tilo has written a, a, a lovely chapter in a new book that uh, he's done about how he just stood there. <laughs> he didn't understand what I was trying to say. He thought it was about the smell of Parkinson's and the loss of smell in Parkinson's. So he asked me to repeat it. And then he more or less said, well, yeah, could we speak about this later? And it wasn't until he was in a meeting with, uh, it was a dinner actually, and he mentioned it to a woman who was in uh, cancer research and her words were, go and find that woman. And uh, he did. He found me through Parkinson's UK and uh, he had already spoken to Professor Pudita Barn. And I will leave, I will ask her to describe what they did next because it was excellent. It was, they separated me from patients and they had such a good idea. So I'll leave Ferdi to explain it. So, so we are very, very curious about this. How, how do you, how do you grade? Uh, is it intense or, or sent or, or how do you grade it? Because you, you, you are able to. Okay, to so I can I can give some a few One. answers to this and, and then um some yes. prospects for, for the future. So um, Joy is able to grade when she meets individuals with Parkinson's. She's able to and she does grade their odour um, and in the majority of cases that correlates to the severity of their symptoms at that time. That does not always mean that they are um, towards the end of, of the disease. Sometimes it does, but it doesn't. It, it, it often means that their symptoms are not well controlled by the medication or exercise or, or lifestyle that they are, that they are adopting. In terms of what we do, um, we are taking we are not, we're taking swabs from patients. So we either use um, just a cotton bud like this, where people can 
even themselves wipe the back of their neck so that so they so they do this or or they do they have a a, a friend or or a, a clinical helper who rubs some gauze to the back of their neck so that's what we do the amount that the the pressure that people may um give to that is 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 varies um and as i'm sure most of you know people with parkinson's do produce more sebum and that's the oily substance that we are sampling than other people so some um some people were concerned that we were only measuring more sebum and not more odor or not more parkinson's but actually we found that even a um, a, a very, very well swabbed person without Parkinson's will not give us the distinctive signature that we get from a, a lightly swabbed person with Parkinson's. And so we have sensitivity in our mass spectrometer to distinguish those individuals now with a very good sensitivity. So it's around about 97% um, wow. we are able to wow. distinguish the the compounds that are on the skin of people with Parkinson's from, from those without. Amazing. Now, a really good neurologist can, you know, if people can get to see a really good neurologist, which in some parts of the world they cannot, and I know you all know this, but it's part of our motivation. Um, a really good neurologist could, can normally, if they're a movement disorder specialist, they're, they're normally about between 80 and 85%, but they're not 97 um, and part of the reason for that is perhaps because there are different forms of Parkinson's disease and perhaps because, and particularly with respect to movement, I think there's a lot of the um, diagnosis is primarily on movement and that's not the only symptoms for some people. So there is a myopia in, 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 diagnos in diagnosis. And, and then and perhaps another thing to say is there are perhaps people who have Parkinson's related conditions which don't present, but are work so far um, shows that we really are able to distinguish. Now, tr to try now to answer your question, we don't really have the samples to do that. We haven't yet done that. So what you're discussing is, is a, a would be a longitudinal study where we would look at the same individuals as a perhaps at a two month interval, Perhaps, perhaps more frequently, um, and they would tell us, or they would perhaps write into an app or something like this about their that their symptoms, their self-presented symptoms, and um, potentially the, the 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 efforts they were taking to to resolve that. Joy has done one such study with her nose with one individual, and she uh, well, she can tell you a bit more about that. Um, we haven't done that because our primary focus has been on developing a method that's got clinical utility. So just before Joy tells you about Alison, I'll tell you a little bit more about us. So we, <clears throat> Joy can only really smell samples from people. She can really do, she can easily do five in a day. She can at a push do 10. And if she pushes beyond 10, it often gets difficult. So her throughput is, is about 10 per day. We've been trying to make a method which would have a throughput per mass spectrometer of about 200 to 250 patient samples per day. That's what we'd like to do because if we were to do that, that would make a test that would cost, including the person and the machine and 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 on all the materials, that would cost or, or the cost, maybe not what it'd be sold for, but the cost would be about twenty dollars per per patient. Okay, so that's a that's our kind of aim. That's been our aim is to make something that is um that because even in our labs we could we could run you know we could do a certain number, but we couldn't do everything. So we want to try to make a method that could be used in in other labs, and and the method we're developing is very similar to the method that's used across the global north to screen babies for metabolic disorders. And that's using a dry blood spot, which then goes to hospital labs and the molecules in that blood are looked at to see if that baby has a, a disorder. We're trying to do the same thing. So our, our focus really has been on, on, the, the, on the diagnosis side rather than what you've asked, Leonard, very good question which is which is the 
prognosis side. So Joy has evidence about prognosis. We have the beginnings of evidence because we have looked at people who are drug naive and later stage, and we do see differences. So I think there is a prospect for us to be able to use this method prognostically so to help to inform on how the disease is progressing and how the disease is progressing along with playing ping pong or, or, or other fantastic interventions that people can do. So I don't know, Joy, do you want to talk a bit more about Alison? Because I think that sets the scene from the point of view of the odour and then we can discuss more. Uh, Dr. Alison Williams is slightly older than me. Um, she has had Parkinson's for uh, she was diagnosed about 18 years ago, but she, she knows now she has had Parkinson's for over 22 to 25 years. Alison and I met at the Royal College of Physicians in Edinburgh. Her husband was the uh, leader for the Edinburgh group at the time. And they had a lot to do with what is called the Edinburgh Research Interest Group. So I was introduced to Alison and I was looking at a woman slightly older than me very hunched, could hardly speak. The whispers were, I, I really, really had to get up close to her. Too. But we hit it off straight away. She was hunched. She was shuffling. A few months later, I met Alison. And she had told me that night that she was considering doing exercise. She was going to get herself a trainer. So we have done a four-year study of literally a few months after she had her trainer. And she is an expert at taking um, diary notes. She does it impeccably. So we then, she then, we sat down and she then showed me the, the first two months notes, two, three months notes. And I said to her, look, I'm going to have to go back to Perdy because I've got to ask permission. I can't ethically tell you. So I went back to Professor Petita Barn and she said, well, it's a one-to-one. -one. Yes, I give you permission. So I went back to Alison and she said, right, we are. And she, Alison has done several papers on Parkinson's. She's a patient advocate. And so it went extremely well. So she was sending me the swabs. Um, I showed David, her other half, how to take the swabs. She was sending me the swabs. I'd got two packs of the swabs that we used. And it was amazing. She had been a, le a high three. Now I can, I do it in four for every disease I that we I have my nose has looked at or has <laughs> I've sensed and used it for. One is very, you know, I have to, I always look for the person. I should describe this. I always look for the person first and then I look for the disease. So I'm smelling for the person and I find the volatiles that are there that are the disease. So one is just, I have to search. Two is I don't have to search so hard. There, there are more volatile. Three, it's, you know, it's mostly the disease and there's very little of the person. Four, there's no person. Wow. I, as I'm taking it out of the cover, out of the sealed bag, I am going, I'm backing away from it. Wow. because the volatiles are so strong for me. So Alison had started at a high three, which I was standing in the Royal College uh, of Physicians in Edinburgh going, oh dear. So by the time she had had her um, trainer and uh, David and her had started Latin dancing as well and a little bit of Taekwondo, I was looking at somebody that was a mid two. So going from a high three to a mid two was quite an, an, an impressive feat as far as I was concerned. So which she then said, well, she was going to put diet into it as well, more Mediterranean diet, etc. So we did all this. We catalog, cataloged all the way through what we did for the four years. And she knows when she's going from a one to a two. Now, I think this is somebody, this is something that everybody with Parkinson's should learn. What their actual feeling is of being a level one to a level two to a level three. 
and she can do it quite readily. And we have shown other people how to do it and it works. So it's a, it's a self assessment. Um, but she knows if she's had a bit of a cold or she's been tired, she just creeps up slightly into two, but she knows she has to get herself back into one. And I think it's a, we've been very sort of, um, not secretive about it, but we've not put it out there as much as we could have, because we are actually looking at how the progression of the biomarker is as well. So, yes, the Perdi. But and also, and I think Nenad, you you mentioned this to me before. Alison had the the relationship with Joy. She had the great opportunity to discuss where her symptoms were and what she'd done to alleviate them. And so, whilst the um, absolute outcome, objective measure, or some objective measure of the odor was there we need to do that same study but without the um i don't know about without we can't provide i guess what i'm trying to say here is we can't provide a joy for everyone <laughs> neither to measure whether they've got parkinson's nor nor to be there to tell them how well we're doing but i think and and i guess this group is one example of that there is a tremendous amount of help within the community of people with parkinson's plus there is also apps right and there are there are opportunities for some measurement to be made which would give some level of where people are some patient reporting which i think will be a, a very good thing for the individuals and a way of using that to feedback what you said to me and adam this is exactly what joy says and other people with parkinson's say is the problem is in, in britain you're lucky if you see a neurologist once a year and that's for a short amount of time. And that's not the fault of the neurologist. That's just the way we are with, with, with public healthcare systems, right? That's where we are. But what we want is something that gives people a more regular feedback on, on, on where they are. And I think that's what you, you, you said to me. And I think some of that can be how well one feels. And we can we could think about that. But I think if we could combine some technology some support group and, and and some measurement that would probably provide a, a better way of allowing people to, to to be also told um i i am doing the nike running app at the moment and um it's great and even though i know that coach bennett who also coaches the sort of olympic nike runners um is not really talking to me it sounds pretty good when I'm running to have the, the Nike head coach talk in my ear about that I'm doing a bit better than I was last week. Um, and so, even though he actually doesn't know that. But I think I think if we could use a way of combining technology as in, you know, a feed a, a feedback, both both it feeding forward from the patient, how they're feeling, what they have, algorithms that look at at that and think about it plus a plus a measurement which i've said is is a relatively cheap measurement and we're really trying to i mean you know we're getting it to a point where it's the the most expensive things are the kind of the postage of, of the sample right so if we can if we can try and work on those things i i, I think that well I, I hope that would be helpful for people. but but we're not i'm not you know this is not something we can offer now i think this is something we we can work towards I think that the, the the four things are treat, um, you know, sorry, diagnose, treat, and 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 then after that comes comes prevent and cure, right? So I think we have to we have to work like that. It has to be diagnose, treat, prevent, cure. There's a kind of this is a this is how we this is how the 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 any disease we we should look at it. And so diagnosis definitely comes first treatment comes then and then this kind of looking at how people are with the treatment is is this it's it's preventing it's 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 not preventing everything but it's preventing some things and then cure which is your great ambition comes at the end um, of those things so we have uh, plenty of questions uh, i can ask people to to set up in chat their question but did, did, did you find other people that, with the same talent Yes. How many? Oh, uh, 
I have, I mean, we, 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 we get letters every day um, and those fall into different camps, but, but they are either people who have um, noticed the odour previously on someone they know has Parkinson's and that's quite common, particularly from women um, and particularly actually from, from children. I've had quite a few from people who've noticed it in their grandparents who have had Parkinson's and they've told me this. So, so I, I don't know, like 100, 200 every year we have who are, I think, credible. Um, I get more. I Yeah, I get more. no, I mean, but but yeah, I mean, sorry, there, there, it is not, it is not uncommon. And, that, and then we also have some clinicians who, who tell us that they can smell it too. And that's actually, um, uh, we, we work with Daniela Berg in, in Kiel University in Germany and her, she has a, a clinician within her team who, who was able to distinguish the odour as well. And so that's good. And we've had clinicians who've said now they've started thinking about it, they also notice it too. So there is a, you, you I I don't have a very good sense of smell, but I can now smell it. It's a, you, you learn, Joy's taught me a lot about smelling. <laughs> and, and what Joy did with Alison was to teach Alison to smell herself. Wow. be able to yes. smell herself okay. sense her own wellness i think i put yeah, it in a sorry, yeah. it's not her, sense yes, her own smell, wellness. Yes. yeah smell in this case is an unusual word to use because as with most people with parkinson's her sense of smell is is less good and that's been affected but to to have her own version of that kind of sense um and and, and joy really worked on that with Alison and I and I suspect that's the sort of thing that as I said a kind of combined more more um reporting better reporting from the patient and maybe from a method um better understanding of, of, of the not you know not just the strong symptoms the other symptoms that's what Joy always talks about and I know it's what people with Parkinson talk about it's the other symptoms the non-motor symptoms um and I think those are things that people need to be aware of changes within those um you think that was so, one of the things with Alison she found that I could make a difference to her non-motor symptoms and I know I know myself and you know speaking in groups etc that the uh, neurology is more well, homed in onto the motor symptoms however there are <laughs> quite a lot non-motor symptoms that you've possibly had before long time before you in actual fact have been diagnosed and it does make that difference um, and I think that is very helpful for people with Parkinson's because at your meetings with your neurologist they're not as sensitive and I know this from speaking to an awful lot of people with, but not as sensitive about the non-motor symptoms as they are about the motor symptoms. So it isn't, it is a, a package, isn't it? It's a whole, it's looking at the whole person. I will st it, <laughs> quote Alison. She was uh, diagnosed with her diabetes and she said to her neurologist, oh, will it affect my Parkinson's? He said, no, no, it's a completely different uh, system. And she said, I do believe I live in one skin. And I think that is, you know, uh, I was at a lecture with Professor Camille Carroll, where she is looking at a, a more holistic um, uh, set of uh, oh, meetings with people with Parkinson's. So how does the, the, the mainstream science treat you? Mainstream. How do they see you? <laughs> uh, I am never rude. Um, I do point out some things that I feel neurologists are missing, uh, but I'm polite about it. Um, but I'm finding it, it, it is, I'm finding it on the patient advocacy. I mean, there's 200 of us here. And to much to my surprise, there are more than half of the people here at UPATI at the uh, fellowship know me. <laughs> I don't know them, but they know of me. And I found that um, at the Barcelona conference, uh, it, it, it when Eli Pollard put up the assessment uh, and the looking at all the photographs and everything, it started off with the most selfied person at the conference. 
And I burst out laughing because it said Joy Milne. And by the second day, my face was sore, <laughs> smiling, because people were taking... So the community is very, very interested. I know the Parkinson's community are very interested in what we're doing. And there are uh, a number of within the Neurological Science Committee, especially biotechnology, and uh, but within the, I would say, the medical community are very, very interested. Um, because it is, we quote uh, David Creston in uh, 1921 as having described the sebum. He was a cardiologist, uh, but he was seeing Parkinson's patients and he described it in 1921. So it isn't a uh, something that hasn't been recognised before. I think mostly um, that the, the clinical community are very positive, certainly here in in the UK, there is a there is a real problem with with just not enough just not enough money to see people who've got suspected Parkinson's disease. There just isn't enough money. So the waiting times in the UK to see a neurologist if you've been referred by your primary physician is is up to two years at the moment. And if you're over seventy five, you're not going to be referred because it's considered to be too late this is the same with alzheimer's actually it's the same so i think the opportunity to have a test that would help to triage um, diagnosis is something that people are very very keen on i think the opportunity in where there's a big um, ring trial for all of the medication that is currently being developed for for, for people with parkinson's in early stages so so particularly being trialed on, on LARC um, patients and also RBD patients. Um, there is a big ring trial which is being led by a, a UK group um, and they they are very keen to have us involved in, in that so that, that so that our testing and um, uh, measuring method can can be um, can be used. So I don't I think there is not a um, no, I think I think actually from 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 there's been we've had a bit more resistance from the analytical science community because no one ever thought of sebum as a useful biofluid. So so it just so happened that we were the first people to do that, and I think that caused quite a lot of um, surprise. Um, and it was Joy who who let us do that. And whilst people are very aware of, of course, the use of blood and saliva and even tears and urine um, as as some. Um, biofluids for, for analysis, people had never thought that this method could be used. I think there we've had some um, a little bit of challenges. Um, the odour part has been very interesting because actually um, a lot of people know that they both, that people's odour changes. No one, no one denies that babies don't smell delicious, right? Everyone says that babies smell delicious. And babies have lots of sebum all over their heads. And 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 whether it is that we're taught to smell them as being delicious or whether or whether they really do is something I don't know. But no one denies that. What people do deny or don't talk about is that when people are very close to the end of life, and I'm not here talking about Parkinson's, I'm talking generally, when people are close to end of life, they, they also have an odour. And there we don't talk about it, and certainly not in in Western society, we don't talk about it, but it is well known. And sometimes children say, oh, mm, granny smells not very nice. And you say, well, granny's not very well. And, and so I think there is a really interesting um, other discussion about odour and disease and why we can smell disease and why we haven't used it more um and and that's another that's another thing um but i think combining it because it's not there are people like joy but it is quite difficult to grade odor she does it and she's very very she's really been very good and she's fortunate and not fortunate she's fortunate that she was a nurse and she didn't do what lots of people with a good sense of smell do which is to not have anything to do with strong odors because she was a nurse she had to work with strong odors so she had to work out how to 
distinguish and be able to separate and identify those odors. So that was kind of fortunate. And then the unfortunate thing, which is why we're here, is because Les was diagnosed, well, he was diagnosed at 44, but she smelt the smell a decade earlier. So so it was the really awful thing of her being a nurse with a, who trained her sense of smell, who then had a husband who, who, who really started to exhibit signs of Parkinson's in his early 30s. And so that's a... That's a very, un I mean, going back to your question, Anna, that, that most of the people who, who write to us are people who it's their father or their brother or their husband and they are older. And that's, you know, that, but I think the kind of unusual combination of circumstances that with Joy and Les meant that she noticed this odour well before him being diagnosed and was able to notice it and that both of them were in a position where they, Eventually, then they knew when they linked it back to Parkinson's. Right when they linked it back to Parkinson's, they they knew that 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 could be used somehow. And so, lots of people that write to us say, "I wish I'd done something with it." Thank you so much for doing something with it because I now realise I noticed this before. I had a lady. Um, I think I said this to you before. I had a lady who was a hairdresser write to us and say she had a client who had a very changed odour, and then the client um, some years after she didn't specify but some years after told her she had Parkinson's and that was very that really made me think because it, you know hairdressers are well a they're they're around here aren't they hairdressers they spend time around the place where we swab from and, and also they see people probably more frequently than neurologists um, and so they probably provide a good um yeah, feedback. So. It's very interesting. Uh, we have uh, prominent people here from uh, from uh, yeah, but... pharmaceutical industry. How can we how can we help? Uh, we are ping pong parties, and we have a couple of thousands of people who are committed to to, to the cause. And uh, we are also st it started with the, with the tremor and shaking up the world. That's what we say in the book uh, uh, because it helps us. Uh, when, for for example, I couldn't play guitar anymore. But after I started to play ping pong, I could play guitar again. So I, I, I know people who couldn't walk and they're walking now, who couldn't talk and they're talking now. So so these exercises, especially ping pong or table tennis, that hand-eye coordination, balance and all of this. So it's it's a but it's on the margin of, of, of a science. That they, they're they're applauding us, but they're not doing much. Maybe small clinical trials are in progress right now. But uh, uh, how can we accept finding uh, financing for it? Because I think it, this is a major discovery. That, that's what I see this as a major discovery. Because if you, can, if you can find out five years or three years before science can do it, then they can follow up. They can they can examine these people and uh, record everything and find out why this, something changed. So this is the first time that I see that people are not looking for the lost keys under the street lamp. They're looking in the dark, in, in, in the sh shadows. And, and, and this is like, for me, I would be jumping out of joy when, when I, no, no, no pun intended, but uh, when, when I heard your story, I, I would, if I'm a pharmaceutical uh, company, I would be jumping like, like crazy, like, Let, let's, let's do this. Yeah, so so I think um, let me thank you, thank you also for for, for your um, positive words and 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 for offering to help. I think there are um, different things that could be done. I think it would be um, very good, very good to think about a longitudinal study on the effects of, of exercise and other non pharmaceutical, and perhaps to cons perhaps use that in conjunction with a pharmaceutical trial. And I think that would be a very good thing. So to look at the uh, placebo group and to look at a placebo group who are doing exercise and to have people in the trial. And I think it would be a really excellent to try and understand the effects of, of exercise on, on, on symptoms and on markers of progression. And I, I, I think that would be, let's think about how we could put such a study together the great advantage that we have is that our sampling is so non-invasive and, and easy for anyone to do, and that there's no needles and no, you know, and, and, and no cold storage, and, and so that's a very good thing. So I think um, being able to to um, prove is a 
hard work, but being able to show <laughs> what you've already experienced, right? Uh, if you can show it in in a way that isn't just an individual, then then that really helps. So being able to show that exercise really does help people um, and exercise and the right medication probably also really helps people. And maybe as in the case of um, Alison um, with Joy, the use of exercise enables her to reduce the amount of medication that she takes, which actually is a, would be a very good thing um, if, if, in some cases. So I think being able to recruit from your from your group people who would like to take part in such an activity would be very would be really would be really good. Um, I think it would be forward the paper. Huh? I would forward the paper. Yeah, Alison has given. We've they agreed. Yeah. Whoever wants it can have it. Yes, yeah. and I think it would be perhaps very good to have an event and maybe to think about an event and you said and I and I wouldn't I would be keen to do it to, to host an event in, a ping pong event for Parkinson's in Manchester because I think it would be a very good way of raising awareness and, and I think it would be very good for us to try to see and I don't know if we will be able to and so this will be a big experiment for us to be able to distinguish the people playing before they've played and after they've played and, and why don't we try to do that because that would be a rather good immediate thing which would not be very difficult for us to do um, it didn't, wouldn't have to be a Manchester it could be somewhere else but I'm just saying we could we could do that where we would swap people before they played ping pong and after they played ping pong and just see if it made a difference and I don't know the answer to that I don't know but it would be interesting to see um and 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 I'm and also we're very keen to you know if anyone has um, connections with pharmaceutical companies who would be interested to talk with us about using our methodology alongside um, looking at how a particular other treatment pharmaceutical treatment is affecting people's the progression of their Parkinson's and we would be very keen to do that too um, and that's it that would be you know, we're, we're here to. Offer. And we're also here to transfer our technology to, to pharmaceutical companies should they be interested. So it's not just that we don't, you know, we really don't want it to just be us that do this. And there are other labs that are beginning to do it now. We really want this to be something that, that could be could be transferred. Um, yeah. Yeah, can, I, can I just jump in a little bit? Um, hi, everyone. Uh, so I'm really new to everything. I have practiced for two years and I'm really young, so I mean, you have disease, so yeah, a lot of questions here. But uh, one question here you had you said you have a lot of support uh, for medical uh, for medicine and, and research side and science. But uh, when you said when you were saying about the app or, or about the people like putting their information or, the, or the, reading, the, uh, reading the diary of the disease or so on. Uh, you said there's no such thing, or is there something being developed, or do you have someone that wants to, like? Uh, is yeah. There... So, so we yeah. we we just, just before of... just before you answer, I want to say that Ivan is a gold medalist from the last world championship. Oh, yeah. the... <laughs> well, you know Gary, yeah. you know my friend Gary. Yeah. Hmm? Who? Gary. Uh, there was a lot. There was three hundred people. Oh yeah, well, he got the silver medal. <laughs> Sorry, oh, I depend depends in which category. There's a lot of categories. Ah, oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Congratulations, Ivan. So, so with respect to what you've just asked us, there is no app at the moment. Um, we have specified an app, so we sort of know what it would look like, mm -hmm. um, and we have. Joy's been involved with a big women's group for people with Parkinson's asking, and they do, they have a, a web app that specifically asks questions that are related to women with Parkinson's. And so we have some um, insights from that. And that was actually a big, there was a big survey done around the, that questionnaire. So, um, and interestingly, a lot of the period tracker the menstrual cycle tracker apps actually are kind of giving the, the framework for such a thing because we you know so there is a so we we have some questions we we've i mean sorry we have some questions that could be within an app and and, and i think 
in always the design of such things, you have to remember that people might be really keen on day one, and then by the you know 60th day, they think, oh, gosh, really, do I have to do it again? So that mm -hmm. need to make sure that it suits the user is important, um, mm -hmm. which is why probably combining it with some feedback <laughs> it, it, it is what we need. So so we have um, yeah we we have a kind of prototype if you like. Um, one of my colleagues at Manchester made an app called Cloudy with a Chance of Pain about people who suffer from pain, not, not for Parkinson's only, mm -hmm. but generally about pain. And that's a very uh, relating the, the their stages to, to pain suffering. And so that's another example of something that, that, that works well. So no, we haven't got one, but I would propose that if we were to do a serious kind of global trial of mm -hmm. how people's symptoms can be alleviated by correct medication dosage to help to alleviate symptoms with correct medication and exercise right so it's a sort of you want it to get better um then then i think it would be really good if there was an app and it'd be really good if we had some if we were doing some testing as well and that could be fed in so there's as joy indicated there's the individual and the signal that they have and then there's the disease and the signal that that has and using a kind of longitudinal sampling approach you would be able to look at the variation of of, of Parkinson's signal on top of the on top of the, the person signal and that's the that's an ambition that I think would fit with your with your program yeah this uh, this is a great answer and maybe yeah maybe we can also connect after this and discuss this a bit more I work in an IT company and maybe we can like yeah somehow I'm connect great. all of this yeah, that would be wonderful yeah and there yeah. are there are funding opportunities for such a, you know, for such yeah. a kind of um, information and um, uh, analytical mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, collaboration. But this sounds amazing because, like, why, why wouldn't anyone, like, we should all use the app since it can make us feel better. It can make us relieve it, relieve it, relieve, relieve it our symptoms. So even without, the, like, the great user-friendly experience but we can create the one for sure like we were we are all incentivized to use it more and more for all of us like for our sake and for other people's sake with parkinson's so it could be something great uh, that we could really make an impact yeah and i think going back to what joy was saying what she's been involved with and maybe some people here on the call are involved with having perhaps a partnership app for the carer of the person with Parkinson's would also be mm. appropriate because I think nice. not necessarily at all stages nor for all people, but there comes a time when that information mm -hmm. will also be important. And, and also reassurances and information back to the carer. Now I'm not talking about doing any mass spectrometry on the carer now, but I'm thinking about the whole the whole experience of having Parkinson's. I think that that would be an extremely important thing to Amazing. Then you can compare what maybe someone doesn't want to admit that they're in stage yeah. two. So, so yeah, that would right. be amazing. Yeah, yeah. yeah there's self-reporting and there's, really, yeah. yeah. I would be really glad to connect with you and help you. Uh, help you oh, thank you. Thank you. Quick question, uh, Joy, you said that you can recognize uh, whether somebody is using the right therapy or the, if the therapy is working for them. How do you do this? It is just through the smell. It is a visual and smell. I've done it with several people. It just doesn't have to be visual, though. This is the, the thing that I have, I'm beginning to uh, understand. I mean, I've, what is this? With Les, I, I was doing it for 20 odd years, uh, but I've been doing it for seven with the university. It's quite interesting to see how the condition and what they're doing uh, relates to the smell. So it's uh, it's just natural for me. I was born with it. I can't do anything about it. And in actual <laughs> fact, from your point of view, it's getting far better. 
from my point of view, is getting far worse <laughs> because <laughs> I'm having problems going places. And, you know, um, somebody this afternoon went away and uh, uh, after lunch went and put an extra perfume on it that was at my table and I had to move move tables so I just had to simply get up and go I try to remember to 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 um you know bring a mask with me but I hadn't done so today so it is just what I have grown up with and how my grandmother trained me now if you look at my TEDx Joy Milne TEDx Manchester 2023 you see the process of how it has been developed because her mother taught her, her, her you know, great grandmother taught her, her, her mother. She has taught me. My mother it, it lost her sense of smell because she had rheumatic fever. And with the drugs and the amount of antibiotics she had, it wasn't nearly as heightened, which she was very, very peeved about. But my sisters have it. But I'm the one who did nursing. So I'm the one who has the medical olfactory library. And I think it's just a process of growing up with it, so the, the recognition of how well somebody is in the day. Um, and as we're speaking about the app, I mean, that would be a huge benefit to matching. You wouldn't have to me, have me looking at you and smelling you. It would work. So that would be really nice. And also, I think it would be about the collective experience. It's about learning from where other people have been. Um, there's an expression called digital twins, and then there's an expression called molecular twins. And, and I guess the idea might be that supposing someone somewhere who's, who's part of your, this grouping or, or other groupings um, records their symptoms. And of course, we have to take care that we anonymize, and this is not about... You know, that person living there, rather that that person at that stage of the disease, and then we have the molecular signature from that person at that stage, and then they have that person at another stage, and then, but then another person would come along, and you'd have that molecular signature, and you'd say, okay, well that other person, this is the things they did, and those things improved their those things, those exercises, those they improved their molecular, they, they improved their symptoms, and, and and they got to a different molecular signature, and and it might be an amazing thing to try and see, you know, that's like really ambitious, but to try and see whether we could help to see which which treatment journey would be best for a person based on someone else before who's you know who, who, I don't know that's yeah anyway that's a that's a kind of vision <laughs> which I think would be which would be and, and of course not, like we have to be take care with ethics and all those sorts of things but I think it's a but I think that's how people collectively across the world who have the same disease like you were saying about Alison Joy you know you're suffering that in your skin and then everyone in the world is having their experience with Parkinson's in a different environment but it's still their experience with Parkinson's so it would be kind of good to connect that a bit we, we were involved in a program um working which was led by um Dr Richard Walker at Newcastle University in, in the UK but it's working with neurologists across Africa and that it would be good to see if we could involve that program so it's about improving the diagnosis of parkinson's in africa where it's in 10 countries in, in sub-saharan africa where there are ch massive challenges in terms of diagnosing parkinson's and in terms of treatment for parkinson's because they don't have the programs and they don't have effective treatment um, at all it's just, just not available to people so the neurologists are great but there's no it's just not available so there are yeah but people have mobile phones, right? So, so having some link to we'll make an app called One Skin. Yes, One Skin. One Skin app. Yes, yes. it could be the One Skin app. You're quite right, Anna. It, it, it That's quite a good very idea. good. That is very good. Um, you know, it, it is. Um... We'll, we'll do it. We'll we'll, we'll do it. <laughs> good, mm. good. That would be fantastic. It would really be fantastic. Yeah. Mm. So I, I I don't want to hold it too long, but I think we will we will continue this conversation, this dialogue. Uh, I'm, I'm thrilled that you that you responded so well. That, that uh, we, we
we we we admire what what you're doing and just be a big all uh, what you accomplished Thank but you. we want we want to help as many people as possible that's our our yeah, one of the first goals is to help as many people as possible now not in two weeks not in three weeks not in three months now because the time is not on our side so uh, if anybody has a one or two questions you are welcome to ask or, or send a chat but yeah uh, and, and anyone or, yeah. or perhaps what i could do i'm just writing a i'm just finishing off a very big proposal to the uk government to help to try and do some of these things but in the UK with, with collaborators in in Europe and in, in the US. Um, so anyway, like I will be just a bit head under for the next two weeks. But perhaps uh, after that, what I could do was just, just sketch out some of the things I just said, like just in one page about things we could maybe work together to do. And then, and then we could start to have other discussions um, about how we can take that forward and what funding mechanisms where we can where we can look at you know philanthropy at, at michael j fox at whatever we, we just think of mm -hmm. something and, and work together on that fantastic oh, thank you for the dog question yeah we, we just actually we're just about to we've been working with a very good group in um uk called medical detection dogs and they have, um, we've sent swabs to them that we've also looked at here and Joy's also smelt. And they're very good, the dogs, they're very, very good. Um, uh, they, and, and they're, <laughs> my only issue with it, I think actually, so that is a charity. And one of the things they do in that charity is they train dogs to live with people who have um, diabetes, who won't know when they're going to become hypoglycemic. That's often young children, but not only, but often young children. And what they, what those dogs do is they act as an alert system. They smell the onset of hypoglycemia, and they and they alert the family to that event. With the dogs, I think for Parkinson's, that almost might be the best thing they can do would be to be the be the app and the, and the machine because actually and, and to help support the individual the use of dogs in a more um in like a screening sense it's just not it, it's great but it's just not as it's not as um it's not as cheap as mass spectrometry basically <laughs> dogs are great um they also need they need people to look after them they need to be trained they take quite mm -hmm. a long time to be trained so they're so they're wonderful and they and they do do it and they can do it just like joy they can't so the best dogs that they have are beginning to be able to do um a not with parkinson's but with with them they, they do a lot of work on on uh kidney cancer they're able to do a yes, no, and a maybe, okay? So they can do a yes, no, and a maybe. They do it by being trained to, if they smell the smell that's that disease, they they stay by that. They have a, they have a kind of, it's a bit like a, a carousel, and each of them has a sample from each of the patients, and the dogs will stay by the one that's the disease one, and, and then they get a reward like they do with dogs. But the dogs can't do what Joy has done and, and what our machines can do, which is to, to, to sense a, a, an intensity, you know, to, a sort of grading. So there is a, so I think, so they've been fantastic on confirmatory and I think there's, you know, maybe a, a place for that. I think actually in, in some cases, dogs may be good, in, in, as I said, in, a, in more in a, yeah, more in an on, ongoing support role, but, but we'll see. But the, the, there's about to be a, a, a publication that comes out on, on showing how, how well the dogs did, and they and they did they did very well. But they but they need they need they need, like joy. They need looking after. <laughs> no, not this. Smell is new antibiotic. Smell is new antibiotic. Yeah. <laughs> I helped to train peanut and button. And, yeah, uh, that's what they're called, peanut and button. That's right. Yes, yes. <laughs> Doctor Train, peanut. Nice. <laughs> so, uh, I, I, say, I would say uh, thank you very much for for your time, and I, and the, I, I'm sure it's not the last time we we spoke. Uh, I, I didn't advertise much because I was not sure whether Joy can make it. I, I got confirmation like an hour before. The... I'm sorry. Yes, uh, um, I I, I uh, was able to slip out. I wasn't sure whether I would be, but okay. I was able to slip out of my assessment. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, even now, a lot of people showed up. Uh, I, I was aware. I was afraid that if I advertised much in advance, 
that, that it will be overwhelming too much too many people. But uh, whoever is here, I, I recognize a number of very distinguished people here, and who can make a difference. And uh, thank you so much, Joy. You, you really, you really uh, give uh, you know, optimism for us. Another level of optimism in the, that we will find a cure. Uh, and I, I was not, I was not into into cure until recently. I was only improving the lives. But now I think we should look into the solution. And I think with the app, with the uh, even mentioned we will assemble a team that will help do this hmm. and we'll do one skin app and, and we'll, we'll find a cure by 2027. That's, that's the goal. It's living. It is living and enjoying living. Um, you know, the, the, um, I was there with the 1921 people's charter in Britain and it was all about combining everything um, whether you had one disease and it's called CVRM, cardiovascular, metabolic mm. and disease. If you got one, you would soon get the other. Um, and I see that in neurology. And it's the it's the how having lived with Les's mom and him, I see how CVRM proliferates through the body of people with Parkinson's. And that's what we need this combined look at uh, of what people are actually coping with throughout their series of what they're doing and how exercise makes them better and how the different medications can be adjusted to it, it, it is it, it really is progressing I know it's hard to live with because as I say I lived with it um, but I see the progression it's happening so we need to keep very much on our toes and keep going and Nana, it's been super it's been super actually speaking to you so so some, let's talk again mm -hmm. let's do it again thank you yeah. so much in, on, pleasure. on behalf of all of these people who is yes who, thank who, you very much yeah pleasure Thanks. thank so, you for talking I already connected you on, uh, with you all on LinkedIn, so hopefully we can connect this. Oh right. yes, please, yes, do. Um, uh, yes, we'll we'll sort all that out. That would be lovely. Thank you. Bye bye. bye. Speak again. Bye, -bye. bye, -bye. Everybody. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Thank you for organizing, Adina. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Bye.